long session we are going to talk all about DynamoDB today we are going to make persistence searching queries just send me a, a hi in the chat let me write something to you guys here and mute this volume let me see if I can find a way to not have the twitch chat and the broadcast at the same time so I see that it's all going well all right thank you and so just before we start i'd like to review what we've done so far and the purpose of this broadcast and remind you that this is an interactive show we should talk be talking and coding together i want to take this in the direction that you guys are interested and do the things that you want to do and that you need to do on your day to day because this is all about helping you guys be successful with AWS and uh, not give a talk or a lesson but really getting stuff done together and this is important for everybody so we are opening this worldwide to everybody and to be the most inclusive we are doing it initially in english and javascript because that's what most people speak and know but let us know if you'd like to see this in other languages using other features other programming languages other aws services this is really an open space for for us to work together in whatever you guys are interested and in the in the meantime since this is our fourth broadcast we've been collecting information in those gists and you can see um, I will add all links to all the things we've been all the documentation we've been using and all the things we have been doing so far so in the first episode we built uh, initial project from scratch from file new and we are using the most of AWS services and technologies to leverage and help us move forward more quickly and with uh, as efficiently as and scalably as possible so uh, for the content delivery part we are using s3 and cloudfront to ship a static web page we talked about that in the first episode then we talked about using lambda functions for the processing part and then we talked in the third episode about Cognito and how to get authentication and security for your API and today we're going to complete this component with um, persistency and this is pretty much a cycle of what everybody must do in their day-to-day -day jobs I know that uh, there is a lot of different scenarios and things to consider when building an application and everybody is trying to change the world in a different way and it's uh, it's hard to think what you guys are trying to do but I'm sure that everybody needs to store data and retrieve data from web applications this is I, I believe the the cornerstone for most of us and the, uh, our brick and mortar let's say for building uh, any kind of web app and today we finish the this uh, most basic component with DynamoDB so we have and not only we are doing this in a way that everybody can do it it fits on the free tier of AWS which we are going to talk more about later but it is done in a serverless fashion which means that we are not using EC2 and managing servers ourselves but we are building in an application that's totally automated and managed by AWS so yeah thank you David good morning thanks for joining in um, 
glad to know you're building in Java. Uh, we can do things in Java. I'm actually, I do know more Java than I do know JavaScript. This has been quite challenging for me. I, um, I feel much more comfortable in the Java environment and let's uh, do, uh, I, I think we should do a few functions in Java and in Python and whatnot. And that's uh, something that I would love to to build. So let's start and jump right into it. And to begin with, let's make a, a very simple, I suggest we make a very simple um, landing page, right? Yeah, and uh, let's try to capture emails from our users and store that in a database. How does that sound to you guys? I think this is it's probably going to be interesting for everybody because it's going to review and show what we've done so far. So uh, let's try to do it uh, differently and all right. And it will show how to use the, uh, let to deploy the web code and to uh, use the API and store data and one you know when you store one thing you can store pretty much anything you'd like so let's uh, let's see how we can do this with dynamodb so for a start let's create a dynamodb table to store our data just um, before we do the integration part we're going to do the rest of the the web app and the form and the things afterwards but let's start with dynamodb as this is uh, the focus for today. And I'm going to create a table for storing our data. Let's call it just uh, emails or interested, or well, let's try to cap interest in, in any way. Um, registered, I don't know what you would like to call this table. I'll call it emails just to, uh, make sure that we are very clear in, in this very small use case, we can enlarge this afterward. And this is this idea that let's not try to create something bigger than, than we need for now. And so we will have an email address for the, for the registered person. That's just um, a string. And this is going to be the partition key for our table. This is the only thing that you need to tell Dynamo expi explicitly about your schema, which is the partition key that your table is going to use that to spread data around the cluster because Dynamo is a NoSQL database. It's a distributed system for data storage. It's not a SQL database, a database server, as you would uh, understand uh, from a relational world. It's something a bit differently. It will create as many partitions, uh, it will provision as many, as much infrastructure as it needs uh, according to your data ingestion and table provisioning. We will talk about more about that later. And the partition key is going to be used to spread data in the clusters. Uh, so your uh, emails that start with an A, for example, will live in a different server than the data that starts with a B, um, of, and so on and so forth. The data will be spread in the cluster according to this partition key. So it's good to pick a partition key that will have ideally um, uh, a completely balanced uh, distribution you should uh, one good idea for example could be computing a hash or making sure that uh, those keys are even out in the cluster but this is not an easy thing to do we will talk about hotkeys uh, in a moment but the idea to understand is that the partition key is a very very important concept and the first thing is that it's going to be used to spread data all around and you can also add a sort key and a sort key is uh, a secondary key that will allow you to search your your partition key so for example the email address being the partition key 
I could add the registration time. Let's camo case this properly. And this will be another, and then you can search on within an email address. So for example, let's say that someone registered multiple times their email address. Within that email address, you can have a, a further case, further registration because the, consider that DynamoDB works like a giant, persistent, very fast hash map where you can s fetch data by key and optionally by within that key that you can have duplicated by a sort key. For example, uh, if this was a thermometers and sort key could be uh, the date of the reading and the partition key, the ID of the thermometer, so you can within a, one specific thermometer search just today's data, for example. Right? This is a very uh, uh, it's pretty the, the another way to explain it would be like a hash map with two keys, for example or a hash map within a hash map or something like this. Now, in fact, uh, a sorted map inside a hash map would probably be the most correct definition. <laughs> within uh, a specific key, you can have a sorted set of items. That's, that makes uh, more sense, I hope. And then for the, for the table settings, we can define secondary indexes, we can talk about indexes in a bit later, but the idea is if you need to search on other uh, attributes of your item other than your email address or registration time, say you have, for example, other fields that you collected on the page, you can add those in the, as um, secondary indexes. And then the, the provision the capacity for your table is how much, um, how much data you can get in and out of Dynamo per second. And this is pretty cool because this is the, uh, how, you how you provision capacity and this is the, the how much your DynamoDB is going to cost. But this is all that you need to tell Dynamo and it will provision capacity based on the provision need units that you say you need and the data that you have. So if you say that you need five read capacities per second and five read capacities per second, it doesn't matter if you have five gigabytes or five terabytes or five petabytes of data, DynamoDB will, uh, will keep the, the underlying fleet at a size that will provide you with this capacity. But the, we're, we're going to talk more about this, but the thing to understand is that this is on average. So on average, every partition will have a capacity that it adds to the cluster. It does not mean that every key or every partition will have this capacity. We'll talk more about that when we consider DynamoDB performance. The thing to understand by now is that a, how much is a write capacity and how much is actually a read capacity. So the, the then ODB capacity is defined in the documentation page. Let me open that for you guys. And link that in our gist. I will create this public gist and paste the, the address on the, the Twitch chat. And yeah, uh, let's, uh, <laughs> no music, no, no coding, that would be fun. Let, we're going to get to the, to the coding in just a bit. And well, I hope this is, this is hopeful. We're going to get to coding to the table right away. Uh, Silvana, I hope you don't mind. I'm just explaining so that people don't uh, understand Dynamo pretty well, but we're going to get to that coding as soon as possible. Because this is quite important. See, this, uh, I'm, I'd like to show the, just the very uh, cherry picking in the documentation page for the things that you must understand. And one write capacity 
uh, is one kilobyte, one K per second. So this means that our DynamoDB table with five write capacity units is going to be in able to ingest 5K per second. So this may be not um, enough for your application. You may write 10 kilobytes per second. And in the um, and you can change that anytime, by the way, without impacting DynamoDB. You, you can change it live. And in the free tier in AWS, Amazon.com slash free, there is the see the DynamoDB is a non-expiring offer. It means that you every month, not restricted to the first year, we have 25 units of write capacity. And we are going to use just that. And this means 20K per second. And on the read capacity, this is a bit differently. This works a bit differently because on the reads, you may choose between consistent reads and uh, non consistent don't worry, and it's it's very important that we talk about this stuff, this off topic. It's not off topic at all, Souvenir. I'm uh, we are opening this channel for everybody, and I do want to understand what people want. So your input is very uh, important. I really, it's really hard to balance how much explanation, how much coding, and where we should go. And everybody's input is very important. Thank you for for jumping in, uh, David and Suvener, I really appreciate every bit of suggestion that you guys sent. And the, the idea between read, behind read capacity units is that it's, it's differently for strongly consistent reads and eventually consistent reads. You can see that uh, one cap read capacity unit is, is one strongly consistent read or two eventually consistent read. This means that if uh, you can wait for DynamoDB to reach consensus, if you must wait for DynamoDB to reach, to reach consensus and send you the strongly consistent answer, that costs one read capacity unity. But if you can uh, cope with eventual consistency, for example, if you don't need uh, the uh, if you if you may have for microsec milliseconds some kind of different reads, then uh, well you know eventual consistency problems. If your application can handle that, it actually costs half because you can read uh, you can make two of those. Okay, but the the uh, the good thing is that DynamoDB gives you the on the on the API what you want to do if you want to. Uh, if you can cope with, you, you choose when using the API if you want your reads to be consistent or not. That's what I'm, I'm trying to say. So let's go for the, the, the table creation and that's it. We have our table. We can add data to it soon and the See that there is no data. I can just, um, for example, add an item. Say that my my name is my email is fermanjay at amazon.com. If you ever want to reach me, and the registration is, oops, this time let's add a, a timestamp here, or I can even append other fields such as name for example it would be Julia and see that DynamoDB has no schema at all so you can add or remove attributes as you please you don't need to to define anything like this and this is all you need to create a DynamoDB table okay um, so the Java guy uh, if you just get a primary key yeah, the, the, the DynamoDB performance is actually, uh, it should be under a digit of millisecond and we can, it's hard to know what's happening in your case, Java One Guy, but 
it should be it should be consistent we it's hard to understand exactly what's your case if you have a test case uh, you can send to me and we can work with support to solve what, what exactly is going on in this case or we can try to build a similar case here and see how long uh, things take but DiamondDB is all backed by SSDs Every, all data is on SSD and it's pretty fast one thing that makes it quite faster is using the batch uh, reads and gets APIs and it's, it may help so let's let's talk about performance when once we have this is running we can even run some bench some uh, performance testing and scalability testing and fire some some data against it and see how it behaves so now let's uh, create a function to write this data to to DynamoDB so let's uh, create a function on on a lambda function to, to store this and oh, what do you think you guys think that should we use um, uh, lambda so should we use uh, any kind of framework or just creating lambda functions by hand I mean would you like to use serverless framework or just uh, just fire the lambda console and and go so well yeah uh let's just start with the with the console so that there's not too much magic involved and we can recap what's necessary to create this and for the next time we are going we focus on this frameworks and see how we can uh, add some tooling just not to mix and talk about two things at once this and for the comprehension sake this time so on lambda now we can create a lambda function that it's going to be adding that email so I'll create a blank function and just go with the full settings for now and register interest in our product for example and collect user email or email address for follow-up and we're going to use node for that and should collect and store email address just so we know this is working all right and yeah definitely use cloudwatch if you want to understand better the the metrics because there is uh, a different perception of time we, from inside and from outside those functions and make sure you're measuring the correct times is quite important in this case and it you will have to understand the the lambda function uh, takes a time to because the lambda function takes may take a time to to fire up so yeah and we're going to create uh, a new role create uh, a new role from the from the template just because we are going to be very explicit in what this function can do and so public let's call this public functions or i don't know what does this role should be named let's think a bit about this because how we can uh, assign permissions to functions depends on our strategy i like to give uh, public permissions uh, public functions a specific set of permissions but we can we can talk more about permissions in the future uh, let's just create um which role or anything at all here let's say the registration or public role anything should be fine let's say registration role so we know this is a role we created and here we have a couple policies that are already baked in the tool and we can 
we can see how it how it is uh, how they are built but I don't see anyone for DynamoDB specifically so I'm going to just write um, a new function using the create a new role from create a custom role will be more interesting in this case so let's say for now that I will create a new role and it will be called registration role and yeah it's going to allow all those actions and we can we can make it um, customize it later we can customize it later and we need to say it need access to DynamoDB but let's create the function first and it's going to be given this much memory can execute in up to three seconds this should be fine I'll go with the default settings for this one and voila our function is created and now uh, just on the IAM panel we can let it write to DynamoDB so IAM Let's see that role. So it does not have access to DynamoDB. I'll create a new policy saying that it has DynamoDB. Uh, I'll give it full access to, to DynamoDB. We can set a more restrictive policy later and restrict it to only that table or only that uh, some attributes and well you know how it goes let's when let's just move to the more fun part of calling and invoking this this function so now we are going to create the the api for this function using the api gateway so API on API gateway we have the breakless API that's our service the featured items functions we've been working from the previous episodes I'm going to add another method and that's going to yeah uh, we're going to see the those metrics we're going to work with those cloud DynamoDB metrics as soon as it's ingesting data uh, we we can show how it's uh, how it's behaving in latent latency wise so we're going to be receiving HTTP posts or we can receive any any method and oops it's not on the should not create it on the root let me create another resource first and this is going to be uh, register interest and it's going to I'll configure this as a proxy resource so it's uh, it can it can be configured as a proxy resource if you want to catch things that everything under under it uh, but it's not necessary for this I'll enable API gateway cross origin requests as we're going to be using this from several places and it's open API and create this resource and now that put method that post method so we, we receive data and this will be bound to a lambda function and um, it will be proxied all details will be proxied to lambda in the event of our handler function so we don't need to map the map the body and the headers to the into the parameters and use lambda in us is one the function is register interest the function okay all right so we should be giving that function that 
permission and we should be ready to go. So now our, our API should be in call and should be callable. We can, we can easily test that and see here, send, even send a, a request body or a query string parameters. Uh, let's see how we want to, to pass this data. It's probably going to be in the request body and say that, for example, in JSON that, oops, the email address is my email. Huh. No, this is not good enough. That should be fine. And let's test it. So we have an error, and this is a very common one. This um, when we invoke Lambda functions using API Gateway, the response from the Lambda function should be telling API Gateway what to exp what to return in terms of HTTP re response codes and headers. So uh, a function is more likely to use to be something like this. So let me let me format this a bit better. this code set here for you guys this is just my standard initial lambda function what I use for my personal testing and the idea is when you respond to API gateway we saw that in our second broadcast we need to send the response with response status code and headers if we were not using API Gateway proxy feature, this little feature uh, where it passes automatically the parameters and maps it every directly, we could be sending directly the object that we, we want, that would be this result. But as we need to ship this metadata for API Gateway to respond correctly, we do this within our handler function. And Again, uh, this is um, also shipping the context and event that we receive as parameters just so we can see what is coming in and prepare for what's going out. So let me save this function. And now when we execute it from API Gateway, now we have an uh, HTTP success. And in the context, we can see what's going on. We see that in the event, the resource that we had, the interest and that it was a HTTP post and um, the identity who called this function, the, all the identity data and in somewhere we should have the body with the data that we actually want. You could use um, other of, you can use path parameters, query parameters, body. It's all available for you in the in the function. Okay, so now let's uh, do this from the. Let's try to do some UI and invoke this and actually store some data and see how it goes. Let's uh, fire at the iterm. I have the project right here. It's called Breakless, just for the lack of a better name, but it doesn't actually mean anything by now. It's just a standard React application. It's built with React Create app. It's just a, any as any React app that you would find. If you don't know much uh, React, I highly recommend it. Taking a look at React create app, create project. It's a small uh, 
In small command line application to create React projects, it builds the whole things and gives us npm start as a command line so we can fire up our development server and have it running. So ta-da, here is our React app. In our last episode, we've been playing with user registration and authentication, and, but that's all we built. And also we can open Atom in the app just so we have it all the files available and this is our application actually so let's change the our return let's move uh, let's get a more interesting form here I will cut this this div this this is just nothing serious so just from the from the template let's add a welcome to the latest and greatest are you interested and an email form with bound to input field and a button so this dot register interest I mean this should be all we need Receive this event and this is what all we need so far. Right? This is actually this is actually going to be uh, useful. Let me remove all this code from last session. And we actually need to clean this better anyway. We have this all on, on Git, so we shouldn't be much conservative about deleting code. And so this is this method. Uh, let's remove all of this. This is too big. So this method just makes, so I don't cut too much, so. So dot log this e and this doesn't exist anymore. So it should be back to back to blank. And all right. Hello. we've been using let's see if it's uh, going all right on the on the dev tools and just for a second let me just connect this to power just for a second all right this is better hope you guys are still seeing this all right I just just making sure that everything is okay and let's go so we here is the is the event the, the event is coming through okay the web page is all right we are ready to, to access DynamoDB and the way we're going to do this is using the as generated SDKs for API Gateway. So when we deploy this, we have two options for using this API. I'll deploy it to our prod stage. And when we go to stages, we have 
this invoke URL. So here in the prod stage, you can use fetch or any kind of resource to send HTTP requests to this to this location. You don't need to use the the anything else. You can use standard JavaScript to to fire those. But you you can also you can also send uh, use the generated SDKs. You don't need to worry about retries and things like this. And you can a security request signing. It's all it can be all managed and handled by by AWS. So or not by AWS, but by the by the generated SDK. So just make let me make sure the just. The streaming is all right. I'm not seeing many of you in the chat, many chat messages recently. So let me just make sure that we are up and running. And yes, it seems to be live and okay. Are you are you still there? Anybody still listening? Just send a, a message in the in the chat room. Just let me know if this is on the on the track on the way that you guys want to build. If not, just say what you guys would like, and we'll 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 ship it. Just so, just to recap, uh, we have all the components so far. Thank you. We have all we need. We have the, the the table, the function, the lambda function, the properties, the REST interface, and everything. So now in the SDK generation, we can create an SDK for this API in Android, JavaScript, iOS, or Java SDK. You could use uh, anything uh, that ships an HT yeah, anything that fires an HTTP request through this would have the same effect. I'm just using the generated SDK, the SDK for JavaScript, as I think this is a bit simpler. So we should have that downloaded and you can do that using the command line tools as well. This this is not uh, something that you need to do manually. You can automate every of those, each one of those steps that we are doing uh, by hand. You can automate it using the SDK, the the command line tools from AWS. I'm just showing it manually as it's more clear to those not maybe not very familiar with the, the AWS command line. So here is the API Gateway client that I just downloaded, that was just generated, and I'm adding this to replacing the, the old libraries that from, from the previous version. And now what I'd like to do is just create the, use the, using the generated SDK AWS API gateway. I have this in uh, I have this link from the documentation from the last from the last episode, but here is the documentation page where um, it shows how to import those scripts, how to create the new API gateway client and everything. So this let's just make sure this is working and uh, API API client factory is the new API API client factory. As this is React, I need to get this from the from the window object and console log this this client just so you guys see what's in it. And yeah, we should. So here is the, the object and here you see the methods in this object are exactly the ones in our API and we have the register options post as a function and we can use it. So I will just copy the function name and do this when we press the button. and call, call this. 
And this has a, a bit of a peculiar syntax, this method invocations. So let's see in that documentation page how this looks. So we have three sections, body parameters and additional parameters that we may ship. And here's the, let's see how it, how they end up in our lamp, being available to our Lambda function and how do we want to use it. I will beautify this. And let's say, this is param zero value and this is param one value just so we have we have it shipped to to our lambda function and see how it works uh here i'll have the for example the email address that was requested and this is bound to yeah, I, I am Brazilian. <laughs> I, I know the accent can be a bit weird. You, you got me. I'm speaking right now from Sao Paulo, Brazil. And you can, those additional parameters such as uh, headers and query params can be mapped in API Gateway to behave differently. I'm just adding it here so we know how it goes. <laughs> I hope it's not too bad. I hope the English is, is all right. I'm trying to get uh, different accents, but well, I guess this is one of those things. Query param zero, you always have an accent no matter which one. <laughs> and on the you pass those as arguments to the function and then we're going to use the callbacks to actually do anything. Then um, we can log oops it works or we can it the error that it didn't. So, so we should be good. Let's press that button. Ah, I'll, I'll add uh, a default value here in my in my form field, just so we don't have to fill it every time. and when we click this fires um, a request and the request field param zero is not oh it's not allowed in the in the pre-flight response and this header is not mapped by api gateway let's let's go empty with those headers for now and okay fire again All right, so we got um, our response back with a 200. We got data with the co with our context from the Lambda function, the event object with the data that we we wanted, and the items in the uh, in the array. So the Lambda function is being executed correctly, and. Uh, Oh yeah, so for the for the Java, for the Java um, annotations, we do have that. It is possible um, to map. There is kind of a re uh, relational mappings kind of what you would have with uh, Hibernate, JPA, or things like that. Uh, but it's just uh, how Java usually sets it, not. Um, 
not necessarily how everybody would like it to be. And even in Java, I don't know if everybody is in the same page about using uh, or object relational mappings or not, especially that Dynamo not being rela relational, it's a bit diff difficult to, to correlate this to things that are usually good in the relational world, not necessarily here, but yeah. Let's see how like, we can do it both. We can do it both ways and see which one fits best. Um, I will just change browsers here because I'm logging in to, to, to Twitch. And just so that I don't lose Twitch chat every time I refresh the browser. So let's do this on the same Firefox dev tools that we've been using. On the first tab, I will just, oops, paste our Twitch, uh, our localhost app here. All right. Oh, but I don't have the, the dev tools installed, but we're not too much deep on, on React, should be fine. Let's move on with this and so we got the, the the lambda functions being executed now all we have to do is actually get the get the the code the email and insert into the database finally get the finally get the persistent part going so DynamoDB SDK for JavaScript is what we're going to use for that. And let's see if we have some examples to copy from. I'm sure this code is available. And getting started with this class. So this is the DynamoDB client class that we are going to use. We're going just to new AWS and then we'll be using this from Lambda functions is quite simple. We don't need to, to import or, oh, so here's the, the code that we need for creating and reading data. And see in Lambda functions, AWS Lambda JavaScript AWS SDK is already included in the environment so you don't need to to import this it's already pre-built so read writing lambda functions in node.js here's the some examples you just need to require the, the aws sdk and it should be ready to go so let's take these lines i'm doing this as in making it clear where those things are in the documentation so uh, this is the most beginner friendly thing possible and everybody knows where things come from and in our lambda function we have this let's use we are using west east one for for this and our code is supposed to get this Oh, uh, so if I'm using serverless to drive deploy that, um, I'm not yet, but but no, it doesn't. And if code bloat and code size increase your charges, uh, not not necessarily. And yes, we can use serverless, and we are going to use the the serverless framework. I'm just thinking which one uh, you guys would like: uh, serverless or Apex or Chalice or, or whatever and just making sure that people understand lambda before throwing in the the tooling may be may be helpful so let's get the email address from the from the object and making sure we have it ready so the email address is uh, I'm, I'm in a meeting so far. Can just for a second? Sure. I'm sorry. Don't worry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I, I should have booked a, a different one. Don't worry. All right. Yeah. Sorry for that. And email uh, the email. Sorry for that, guys. <laughs> uh, I'm occupying a friend's space here. <laughs> and 
I'm getting the email address from the event and we saw in the event object that we have this set here in the in the returned data from from this we see here in event on body here's where it is so we should parse this JSON and just so we are correct and not copying anything JSON parse just for the exact syntax this is it just JSON parse the text and it should return what we want so in the function event for body equal equals event json dot parse event dot body and the email address should be body dot email address and you should be good to go just making sure that it's going back and forth correctly save the lambda function Object is back. Let's reload this. I mean, request goes, request comes back, response comes back, and in our data we have the email address just as typed. Okay, so it's back and forth, and now all we need is to insert insert this into the DynamoDB table. So create item will take the parameters and do um, a client dot put data or this is the exact syntax and on the lambda page I will comment this as we don't want this uh, all these objects to be in the in the database let's let's just paste this code first and see how it uh, how we want it to behave so on the on the table name that we had just let's go back and see on DynamoDB I remember it's emails but just to be sure the table is emails and here it is and the uh, email address and is this oops email address the title there is none there is just um, a timestamp attribute that we added it is registration time so the registration time is current date in JavaScript I believe this is new date uh, to string how do I get this to string in JavaScript again let's do that search just to make sure that date to string is correct and it's just a simple to string well it's it should work we can then uh, use uh, a better string for search when we consider how to search this data but just to just to begin this should be fine use date dot uh, true string and this should be okay and we're putting this this uh, this item and just not So dot log. Let's just log the the success or error. And yeah, I, 
believe this should work. Let's see. And I don't know what this, there are many things you can return as a result. I will just return an empty body in this case. And it should be should be alright. Oh, those quotes. Insane quotes. Uh, well, this looks looks like it works. Let's save this and test. Save and test. We can even test it from here, saying that we have a, a similar object that the one we have in the in the body. So we, if I recall correctly, we, we need to have a, a body in this and in it we have email address as a field and email address can be literally anything I'll add mine and let's copy this and test just to see if it works well not yet uh, there's a um, unexpected token in my JSON. Hmm. Is it an error? Is it from me? Or is it the, my JSON that is wrong? Huh. Let's try to test with uh, our real object, perhaps. Well, so just a, a bit about the about the performance of JDBC connections and connection pooling is not so tricky in Lambda as it seems. There is some things to be aware of. The most important is the how long it keeps alive. So there is a, a blog post called Understanding Container Reuse in AWS Lambda. I think this is it. So this is a very nice article about Lambda initialization and how long it takes, but you should you should co be able to code that pretty pretty easily. And it's not it's not a big deal, you just have to understand that it may be it may take a while. Okay? And so your lambda function, your lambda latency may be may fluctuate, um, but it's 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 doable if you're so sensitive that the JDBC connection time is making a difference. This is probably the case where you should look at using a cache to make it faster instead of trying to fight uh, JVM initialization times and and things like this. Okay. And of course that. Uh, a ping function to keep instances warm may be, may be also helpful. And, but back to back to our to our testing. Let's uh, let's just see if I will I will add. Uh, I should probably check if this is. Oh, this is event.body, right? Event.body. Oh, it's already it's already here. So this should be okay. So it looks it looks pretty pretty decent. Let's see if it's working from the from the app. So doesn't seem to be. So well, it returned. And it's it's looking good. It returned 200 okay. Uh, but we don't have any data. That's because we're sending it back blank. But if we look into DynamoDB, it may be the case that, well, something went wrong. We need to really check what's going on here. And we can just log it and see how things are in CloudWatch. So here in monitoring, we can see that our Lambda invocation has a few, uh, Lambda function has a few invocations we did by hand. And the, in the console logs, we can see what what happened, and we can add some code to 
to see what's going wrong actually here. So in the event object, we would uh, have a body that have the email address. So I don't know what's going on wrong here, but we can make it more resilient by making this the body.email address or something else. Let's see, an expected token in a JSON at position one in object.parse here is because this event.body is uh, invalid. So I'll add event.body or empty object here just to make sure that this is receiving a proper object and or this should get it fixed. Save and test again. So this is the same one, test. Executing function, huh. unexpected token at position one in the in line five and so it's actually this this body so let me just console dot log this event and making sure it's it's getting it's getting everything it needs can you guys see what's going on here so I'm console.logging the event. So I show the event body that I'm going to parse out. Oh, I should parse this as a string before I test. I don't know, just to have um, something in case it's undefined, it's not complete and just making sure the the thing works. So unexpected token oh this is my badly my poorly formed JSON so let's action configure the test event a bit better is it is it correct let's see if this is valid JSON it's complaining about something jsonlint.com can probably be better than my eyes at it so it is valid JSON and save and test. Still going wrong. Still something very, very weird. Hmm. So on my line six now, yeah, because I'm changing this is not being parsed as my event is not being parsed as uh, correct JSON. Hmm. Is it not? Uh, is it? Does it, do I receive it as a as a string, or is, I'm I'm thinking that event dot body is a string. So let's the body must be parsed. So let's just save and test this and make sure this is doing what we want. So this is this is pretty correct, and let's just make sure if let's see if it perhaps it doesn't need parsing, and I'm trying to parse it. Yeah, so it doesn't need parsing; it's already an object, and I was wrong in thinking that this was uh, just a string. So this is probably uh, more correct. Yeah, thanks a lot, guys. Uh, this will this will make it, and now we should have it working. And test, and ta -da, we got uh, the execution done, and now it's inserted in DynamoDB. So here, when we refresh. I would hope to see it there, but unfortunately it's not. So something must be still wrong here. We create the parameters uh, and we have the, the database. Oh, we didn't call the, we created the create item function, but we didn't actually call it. 
So here we, huh? We don't need this to be in a separate function. This is overkill. So I'm not even defining a function here. Just letting it be. Let's let's just beautify this for sanity's sake. I know, I know, we should be using um, a better ID and not throwing things in here uh, so loosely, but we're go we are going to get to that. Um, uh, I have to save it as something.js so it knows it's JS and now it can be beautiful code, right? So let's try it now. Even test. And it works. So another thing that's important is in our, uh, let's set this response before that we put the, the data on Dynamo. And we can say cons if error console dot. dot we can call back on the error or we can call back on the data right and respond with data or that is in this case our response this looks better So save and test. So it ran, it executed, it lasts for almost as it durated almost one second because we probably could improve this, uh, but let's let's see how it goes. And perhaps giving it more memory. I don't know why it's probably should take uh, less time, but in DynamoDB now we should have finally those registered objects yeah and now if we use for someone at webs.com and in we should have that in DynamoDB no not yet huh Oh, we, we have missing headers for the for it now. The same, the, the same. Uh, it's it should be it should be getting back on the on the function. Let's see here on the headers. We have content type application JSON, but in the function, I'm pretty sure there is this access out control origin that allows uh, our response and. Well, on the Lambda function, it is responding. Let's see if it's, if it's all correct. The result, the response contains the, the headers. If it's not an error, it fires back with the response. So why is this not being invocated correctly? Hmm. Let me take a bit of the blunt uh, of the things that we are not using here in this code in the in the event in the app.js in the event that we call we don't need this query parameters i'm taking this uh, additional params off just to be to be sure just passing what what we need not this which i've shown you how this is passed in the event object and uh, yeah let's check the api gateway how it's, how it's going Oh, the, the body, it's not um, this email, it's, it, this is, was just the default, I should get the this dot email instead of the static address. This helps, so if we sh let's just ship it again, so my email, uh, so I'm 
thing I'm in. No. Huh. Oh, this dot email dot value. This is better. So it ships, it comes back, but it doesn't allow the the request to go through. And in the networks tab, we can see what's going on here more closely. Um, there is this get call. Should it should be we should be having a get call to the the options request is coming back okay. So the pre-flight request for a course is getting a 200 okay. So this should be authorized to ship this request to application error, but we are having this, this problem. Let's just fire on API Gateway then and see what's going on on Breakless API. So this, I'm using the standard Atom uh, installation, not, not using the, yeah, React. React is, is serving the, the web files. And here on resources, on registered items, it should be firing a post to this URL that we can test here again and see if it's still going correctly. So email address should be something. Huh. Yeah, not not coming back correctly. We did something quite wrong. Let's uh, roll back this for for a bit. And we were doing console logs here. So this is success. This is failure. And we were calling back with the response from outside. Let's see what's coming from the from Dynamo first before we. we, we save it and see if this was it now we test it and so since your since my page is yeah but it should be requesting we we test we tested it before it was firing the requests correctly and Oh yeah, from the from the API from the from the Lambda page, uh, but before reaching Lambda, API Gateway should be should be working correctly. So now it's still on on the error. So we need to get back to the function as we had it first, where it worked to uh, to our working state. Let's just make sure this what let's see what's going on here and see. In the test event, let's use the API Gateway template then. And API Gateway proxy. Let's see if there is a better one. API. It's not writable. Oh, it is. So API Gateway AWS proxy. Okay. So the body is AWS. Uh, the body is email address and this is something 
at web TV. And let's see how it goes. Oh yeah, it timed it timed out. Let's then improve the configuration for this and see if that's it. Let's give it one minute. I hope it doesn't take that long or else we will be in financial problems. But let's move that. Let's get this out of the way first. So we now have one minute and our code. Ta -da. It takes a while and exited before. So error is not defined. Yeah, we shouldn't be coding this much in the Lambda console anyway. It's error. I promise for the pro for the next broadcast we are going to use an ID. So now it's now it's okay. Uh, but one or more missing the key email address in the item. It's. It's not going correctly. Uh, missing the key email address in the item. So on the code, the item has email addr, and just make sure it's just like DynamoDB expects. Yes, it it looks correct. So, and before adding it to the table, let's console log it to and make sure that params is okay seven test So the table name is, oh, the email address is undefined there. So it, isn't it valid here in this context? It's not a valid variable for any reason. Oh, because the, the body is, is not different or is it not, uh, J Jason, let's see. Yeah, that's what I was thinking as well. If we should parse the body and let's make sure we do. So body and So now it did, now success. And now on through API Gateway, no data, that's great, success. And now from the app, hello, twitch.tv, and on the console we have okay. And on DynamoDB, we have data. Okay. So finally, so just uh, just let's let's go through everything that we made so far. This was uh, quite in, uh, a long time to get a CRUD running, but finally we have it working and. Let's step through the, the whole thing and see how it goes, the, f uh, the whole process. Just one step that we're missing is shipping this. Yay, thank you guys, this is awesome. 
let's just deploy this to AWS and see what's going on. So this application, we can ship it to an S3 bucket. And I have a bucket set up here. It's called prodless. The, it's this prod.breakless.bike. And let's go to the AWS console to the, and use a bit of the command line tools for AWS. And I have my profile uh, set up here. So using the AWS S3, for example, LS command, you can, I can see my buckets the same way I use in the console and AWS S3 sync the my public uh, all my public folder everything that's here should go to s3 in this in this bucket and i also want to delete anything that is different on the bucket so i now am sure that everything that's generated here is the same as what I have on my AWS bucket, including, including that AWI, that API client that we generated. And on the CloudFront console, we should have a distribution and the distribution is pointing, uh, this content distribution is uh, on CloudFront using the CloudFront edge locations and it's pointing right at our uh, our bucket on the origins it's that very same bucket as a content origin so finally if we type that address we should have that I would hope this very same react app but as you know in developing it's never what you would expect so let's see what's coming from the pipes here oh of course i did um i did not actually build the react apps before shipping to s3 so i believe npm build would be would be i don't recall so let's see on the react create project page react create project it's the tool we've been using i've been playing with it and this is a start and npm run build to run the actual build so run build so it's creating my great production optimized files i hope this doesn't take too much i hope you guys yeah <laughs> yeah thank you guys i'm actually very excited in doing this i hope we can get to more complex scenarios i really want to uh, get a lot of data in that table export it everywhere using SQL, use sql use machine learning use all the cool stuff but i think it's important we show how the bare bones of the application and data collection works as this is actually most of our day jobs right <laughs> and and also making sure this is totally a developer, no bullshit. I'm not here to make any other thing than helping you guys to work with this technology. So this, if you want more code, more explanation, more anything, just let's let's do this. And now that the application is built, we sync with S3 again, and our code should be there. And uh is it generated to public or i'm just or am i syncing the the wrong address it's actually build public is for the for the resources so this explains why oh, this was not working too so this makes more sense and now on firefox on our very last tab No, not yet. Oh, that's probably because caching, right? So we, we may need to purge the caches and make sure that um, the caches are not in our way. Uh, a quick way to test this from other machine and directly from S3 would be to 
invalidate this anyway or to um, zero the the content the max age for this for these headers I will do it both ways so you see how it's how it can be done and in our CloudFront distribution on invalidations I can just say that I want to invalidate everything that's in this cache so this would work and another way to make this work and I will create a different bucket for this is to make it a preview um, or make it available straight from the bucket instead of going through the, the CloudFront distributions but I really don't think that's a problem so yeah so here is the here is our app and it works at twitch.tv for example and you guys are live and it executed correctly let's see if it ended up in DynamoDB and it works it did so the cool thing about this is that we don't have any server at all going on around here we've been totally serverless by the time that our application is not working uh, by the time there's no user there there's no servers to manage so all the servers here are totally managed by AWS behind their services and I don't have to even care uh, what version of Linux is it running and I think this is pretty cool and let's go through the through the through the request and see if we can follow through so by the time we do this it will be pretty confusing so I will close all tabs all other tabs and try to make it more clear uh, and leave page so that we have nothing but the, the web app and the console to start console in the blast Amazon. so are you ready let's go in the we built a, uh, this react code and react is taking this JavaScript and compiling uh, it to a single file a single uh, sorry a single page web application that is running locally here with npm start and serve from local but when we want to share it with users we're going to deploy it to s3 is where those files are actually stored they are stored in this prod blakeless bucket so s3 can be used to store anything i'm here i'm storing index.html but it could be anything and one important feature when using it for web apps is you can set your uh your metadata in your metadata how much caching do you want for example in the in the properties of this index HTML object in the in their in the metadata for this object where is the metadata I'm a bit lost in this new console experience so let me try get this object properties metadata here it is so it's already it already has a content type of text.html and I can add other metadata to it. An important one is cache control to specify, for example, how max age, uh, how long this can stay in cache. And probably a better idea is to do this in deployment. So I can say here that cache control should be um, for example let's say that I want to skip cache for now and specify max age equals to zero I think this is the, the proper the, pr the proper way to do this and but as the bucket was already full it's not much to do I will AWS s3 uh, remove everything here 
another I believe I can make this recursive and just delete everything in that, in that bucket and ship everything again with the new max age setting just so we can see here in the in the console that this my object now will have the proper max age value for for caching and you can do this with your naming standards you can have dot no cache uh, files that have max age equals to zero and others that have uh, huge caching according to your app and then I'm not exposing my bucket straight through the world we know that uh, it's a better idea to use HTTP content delivery networks such as CloudFront to spread this traffic and we saw in the CloudFront in the first episode that this is better for performance as you have uh, edge location closures to the user it's better for costs as those cached requests doesn't does not hit your backend resources and it's better for security as attacks are against CloudFront first before reaching your instance and then when we when we type this address and I will add it here you can uh, you can try it for yourselves and see how long it takes to, to open near to, near to you. And once we hit, uh, in there's one special line here in the in our in our app, and this is this API gateway client factory dot create client uh, dot create client. So this here will ship the the requests to. API Gateway. This was a client generated by API Gateway and it is here on stages. When we deployed to our production stage, we generated the SDK and that's where that Cape code come, came from. In this case, JavaScript, but it could have been Android, iOS or Java SDK or if you want it in another language that does not feature SDK generation, you can easily fire HTTP requests to this address and it will have the same effect. This will trigger our API definition in API Gateway that in turn will call that method and our Lambda function on Lambda we have this register interest function that already has the client for DynamoDB here. And in this case, we do a very simple put item. In, in future, future features, we will have put item in batch and query and scan this table and use further options for DynamoDB. But this is enough for a simple CRUD. And once we have this lambda function executed dynamodb finally gets our our data so let's see that on dynamodb if you'd like you can fire your own email I, that's not for spam purposes i promise just for software testing and we should see in our email table that we have uh, all those all those items okay so it's almost uh, two hours of broadcast for now. I think this is, uh, we can have a jelly beans and sandwich, <laughs> a jelly beans, sa jelly and bean sandwich and <laughs> whatever, a beer and enjoy. I hope you see that although it is a bit different to work with those cloud services, we have the, the, the code up and running and yeah so yeah i see you guys added some <laughs> your emails there and keep uh, thanks for staying and helping today guys i really appreciate your your input let us know what you would like to see on this stream and we really want to add the um, the content and to get stuff done and actually help you guys do your job and be successful if AWS is my job. So let's help each other each other out. All right. I'm sorry for the for the weird accent and all that. I hope we keep in touch and see you in the next broadcast.
Stay tuned. <laughs>